Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-host, Jim Wilson, Newmark, Caleb Hoppus, Hanlon, Dave Stonecipher, Herbine, Dave Jackowitz, Evolution Financial Group, Chuck Ormsby, Sevenoff, Ormsby, Greenberg, and Jeff Mack from Newmark. Jeffrey, can you please give us a rundown on who we have on the show today? Sure, sure, Herb. We have a great show. Matthew Naylor is the CEO of Crumdale Partners. Uh, we have Dr. William Hayes, CEO of Boys Latin School of Philadelphia. We have Jessica Scully, President Scully Company, and Rory Retrievi is the President and CEO of MidPen Bank. Well, let's get to know our first guest, Matthew Naylor, CEO of Crumdale Partners. Matthew, what is Crumdale Partners? What are you guys doing? Crumdale Partners is one of the fastest growing companies in the United States. We're solving the escalating healthcare costs for group health plans that are self-insured. Uh, Crumdale Partners offers groundbreaking innovation for self-insured medical plans. Mm -hmm. Where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? And where are you in the pecking order? Grew up right outside of Philadelphia in Delaware County. I have four siblings, uh, two brothers and a sister. And uh, eight to 14, what kind of stuff were you up to? I was very active outside. I was an athlete. I'm dyslexic and school wasn't my thing. So being on the athletic field was what I did. Mm hmm. You say you were dyslexic, and um, what, what did that do to you, being dyslexic? You know, when you're dyslexic at that age uh, in a public school environment, um, you learn a lot about yourself, and you face a lot of adversity, um, mm -hmm. adversity that, you know, young people probably shouldn't face. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stonecipher. Matthew, when we were speaking earlier, I was really touched when you were kind of describing your relationship with your mom and dad. Could you expand on that a little bit for me? Yeah, my, my father is my best friend. Uh, he's my greatest mentor, and he was my greatest coach on the athletic field. Um, my mother uh, is my greatest ambassador. Uh, being dyslexic, I needed someone to fight for me and uh, advocate for me, uh, and that's what she did. I wouldn't be where I am today without my parents. The, the intimacy of that relationship is pretty impressive. What, how, does, how do you translate that to uh, building your team today? You know, you have to have a lot of gratitude. you got to be thankful, and you got to treat people the right way. Um, and my parents taught me all those wonderful skills. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackowitz? When uh, did you start uh, first making money, Matt? Probably when I was about 10 years old. Um, I walked to the golf course uh, without my parents' knowledge, and I sat around for about three weeks till I finally got out on the golf course carrying a bag that was probably four times the size of my body uh, for some very nice ladies. So you mentioned in the green room, you, you, you went up there yourself and approached people looking for a job, right? Yep. I mean, at 10 years old, doing that, you know, just putting yourself out there. What, is, what does that have to do with what you're doing today? I think some of it had to do with my dyslexia. Uh, I thought I was going to have a very difficult time in life uh, finding my way. Um, and I think very early on in life, I needed to fight for myself. Um, and I started to build my work ethic and career uh, right then. Mm -hmm. Jim? Yeah, Matthew, you played a lot of sports growing up, you said, and shared that you were a full scholar athlete. What, what sport did you master to become a full scholar athlete? I played soccer. Um, like I said earlier, the classroom wasn't my place. The athletic field was, and I was fortunate enough to have a father that was a, a great coach and a mentor. And I worked really, 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 really hard at it. Was there a particular position you played in soccer? No, I, I did what the coach asked me to do. Uh, they wanted me to play offense. They wanted me to play defense. They wanted me to play midfield. Um, you know, I was very nimble and flexible uh, in where I could play on the field. How does that flexibility relate to what you're doing at Crumdale Partners? I think as an entrepreneur, you have to be nimble and flexible. Lots of entrepreneurs fail um, because they're not resourceful enough or resilient enough. And I think flexibility is a key theme for leadership. Uh, being able to adapt and adjust to people is critically important. Mr. Ormsby. You walked to the golf course. Uh, earlier, you said you uh, walked to school. Uh, what was that like? How long of a walk was it? It was probably about a mile, mile and a half walk to school, sometimes with my brother, Will, who was my best friend growing up, uh, my younger brother. Um, but walking to school was therapy for me. It, was, it g gave me an opportunity to plan for my day. And when you're what, dyslexic, you know, it's yeah, What was that like? Well, you're going into a school environment where the teacher is going to call on you to read or write in front of 30 other students. Uh, you, you had to have your stuff together. You had to think critically and solve a problem. 
And were you, when you were walking along with your uh, uh, friends and, and family, were you consulting with them or are you doing this on your own? Yeah, I consulted with my younger brother a lot. Um, he, he's my best buddy. Uh, he, he helped me uh, immensely along the way. So you surround yourself with good mentors now and in, in your uh, position? Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question. Uh, I have incredible mentors. Um, I think being an entrepreneur, you need a, uh, you're a product of your environment and you learn from others. Um, and I've been very blessed to have incredible people around me in my life. Caleb. Hey, Matt, you remind us how many siblings do you have and where are you at in the pecking order? I have four siblings, an older sister, uh, older brother, younger brother. I'm kind of in the middle. What was your relationship like with your siblings? It was well phenomenal. Like I said, my younger brother, Will, was my best friend growing up. My brother, Chris, and I were super competitive. Um, and my sister, Liz, was, uh, you know, a great older sister that looked after me. Being at the kitchen table, you know, you, you got a family of four. You got you to gotta fight to get your words in edgewise. Did you learn any sort of leadership traits or anything that's helping you today from your siblings? Um, no, not necessarily. I think I learned most of that from my, my father. I, I you heard mean? you say something in the green room. I think it was about leading with gratitude. Was, was that from your siblings or from your father? I, I don't think that was from my siblings or my father. I think that was because of my dyslexia. You learn a lot about empathy and you learn how to uh, treat people the right way. And you learn to have to have, uh, you know, gratitude for the things that are in your life and the people that are in your life. Jeffrey. Matthew, outside of Crumdale Partners, are you active in the community in terms of giving back? I am very active and specifically with uh, learning. Um, I'm the chair of the AIM Academy Board uh, that helps children that have language based learning issues. Uh, dyslexia is my passion and making a difference in uh, young people's lives is what I'm focused on. What are you talking about? Tell me more. Well, I think young people, you know, here in Philadelphia, uh, you're born into a family and you're born into a community and you're disadvantaged because of the potential school that you're in. Uh, AIM has a massive impact on children and gives them an opportunity to learn how to read and write and be successful in life. And for me to have uh, an opportunity to have an impact on those kids is incred incredibly important to me. How do you know you're having an impact on those kids? You know, it's just by example, you know, by showing people that, you know, you can be resourceful, you can be resilient, you can be relentless in life, you can have passion and purpose, you can have happiness in your heart. And by showing that example to young people, you can aspire them to do great things. You're not angry that you were put in the wrong school and had to suffer? I think, uh, yeah, I was. Early on in my career as an entrepreneur, I think I did a lot of things that I would have liked to have done differently uh, because I was angry. Um, but you know, that anger turned into great passion and great purpose. If, if we knew you better, what, what am I missing? What chunk of you are we missing in this interview? You know, I don't think you're, you're missing a lot. I think I, I find that, you know, you have to have passion and purpose in your life. You have to have happiness in your heart and whatever you do personally or professionally. And I hope that I can pass it along to others. Pass what along to others? Teach them about having happiness in their heart. Life is short. Uh, we only get a finite period here uh, in this world, and everybody only gets 24 hours in a day. And I think people should use their 24 hours uh, in a way that uh, serves them and their unique abilities and makes an impact on their communities. Wait a minute. When I asked you what is this Crumdale Partners, you made it a point to tell me you're one of the fastest growing companies in the country. You must be money hungry. Is that what feeds you? Is that what's meaningful to you? No, um, making a difference in people's lives. I have five incredible partners. I get the most gratitude and, and satisfaction uh, personally and professionally out of helping other people. Um, Crumdale Partners culture is made up of that. Wait a minute. You have five, why, why would you have five partners? In, wait a minute. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I had four uh, brothers, uh, well, four siblings. Two, do, you think two, the, two brothers. do you think the siblings help plant the seeds for your ability to partner? Um, no, I think what planted the seed for partnership was my dyslexia. You know, I realized early on in my life that I wasn't going to be the smartest person in the room and I needed to surround myself with great people that had a great character and that were going to help others. Um, it's pretty, pretty simple. There's three simple principles. You got to work hard. You got to do the right thing and you got to help people around you. Wait a minute. Those are your three guiding principles. Those are my three guiding principles. People need to work hard. You need to do the right thing and doing the right thing is not always easy. Um, and you need to help others. And when you do that and you have proper alignment, you can create, a, create an incredible culture. 
Well, you're growing. You're one of the fastest growing companies. I guess you know what you're talking about. What, what, what's the website address of your company? Crumdale Partners. How, how do you? How do you? It's C R U M D A L E Partners. dot com. Yes. Yes. Uh, we've been speaking with Matthew Naylor, CEO of Crumdale Partners, here on Executive Leaders Radio. Uh, don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com. That's executiveleadersradio.com. To learn more about our executive leaders, we'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. Don't go anywhere. And your name and organization is? Kim Arnold, Meridian Bank. And Kim, what kind of experience did you have in your background that gave you the ability to deal with all the different kinds of people you deal with in banking? I grew up in a very diverse uh, atmosphere. I had wealthy grandparents, then I was plunged into poverty in a commune type setting. I understood socioeconomic diversity, I understood race diversity, and uh, it's led me to understand why people are motivated to do what they do and be able to talk to people of all walks, colors, uh, socioeconomic. And so as a banker, when you meet people, you're interested in the person as opposed to just the numbers, aren't you? 100%. I want to know why they're growing their business, why they're in their business, and what their passion is. I bet your clients really appreciate you because you want to get to know who they are. And I guess, I guess you're able to really bond with your clients, which is good for the bank and good for your clients. What's the website address for your bank, Meridian Bank? Meridianbank.com. Let me have that one more time. Meridianbank.com. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Dr. William Hayes, CEO, Boys Latin of Philadelphia. Dr. Hayes, what is Boys Latin of Philadelphia? What are you guys doing? Boys Latin is an all-male charter network of two schools educating young men in grade 6 through 12. We have approximately 800 students in West Philadelphia. Okay, West Philadelphia. And where are you from? How many brothers and sisters? And where are you in the pecking order? I'm from Hartsville, South Carolina. I have three younger brothers. I'm the oldest of four. You're the oldest of four. And what were you doing eight to 14? What kind of stuff were you up to? I was involved in a number of things. I played football, ran track, did community plays, heavily involved in church, uh, an academic quiz bowl, student council. Mm -hmm. All righty, Mr. Jackowitz. Dr. Hayes, what impact um, did your mother have on you? Yeah, my mother was my mother was my rock. Uh, she taught me how to sacrifice without complaining, um, how to just lead and love without a limit. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yep, I think it's extremely difficult to be a single parent at any uh, age and any day. And so watching my mother raise the four of us, I felt compelled and obligated to uh, remove any challenge uh, that she had to face as related to ra- raising me. So I supported in every way I could. What do you mean? Tell us more. You felt you felt you had to remove obstacles for your mom? Yeah. So I think as the firstborn, I felt compelled to support my younger siblings. And whether that meant dropping them off at school, walking them to school, picking them up, I didn't want to add an additional burden to my mother's life, realizing she was already sacrificing for us. So the seeds were planted very early for you to be the CEO of Boys Latin in Philadelphia, considering the relationship you had, the responsibility you took with your siblings? Yep, I think very early on, I've always taken a leadership role just to figure out how I can support those around me and be a better example um, for those that I lead. Okay. Chuck? Football, band, church, choir, as student council, pretty diverse uh, interests. What, uh, what did you find most interesting? I thoroughly enjoyed football. Football was probably my best um, opportunity to connect to my friends both on and off the field. Is it, which, so tell me more about that. What, what's the, uh, the attraction? So when you're from a small town, uh, football reigns supreme. And so we practice seven days a week, um, game days on Fridays. And so just the opportunity to both connect to my friends in school while also playing a sport together, driving towards victory. Are you able to impart some of that to your students that you have at school? Absolutely. I think the number one thing I impart is to work hard with no excuses. My coach has always told me, we're going to face whatever obstacle in front of us, whatever team is in front of us, and the goal is always the same, to win. Mm-hmm. Mr. Stonecipher? 
Dr. Hayes, you told us earlier you're the oldest of four boys, and uh, I'm the oldest uh, boy in my family as well. I know that puts you kind of in a, in a unique spot, if you will. But if I had some time to be with your brothers, what would they say about you? <laughs> they would say that he loves hard, that, that he is the person who's going to always sacrifice, reach out, and support, but he's also going to shoot it to you straight. So being that uh, that role model for the other brothers and leader of the pack, if you will, how does that translate into what you're doing today? I think it also teaches me to see who's in front of me and see how they need to be led. And so my brothers are different in many different ways. And so to support them looks different. And so I show up for all the people I lead in very different ways, depending upon what they need. Mm -hmm. Jim. Yeah. William, you told us you had various jobs growing up, but what's a list of some of those things you were doing? Sounds like you were busy. Yes. My jobs are all over the place. I was a summer camp counselor in seventh grade. I worked at a country club. I drove delivery for Domino's. Um, I worked at a boat making plant before graduating high school. T tell us about your camp counselor job. How, how young were you and, and what was your role in, as a camp counselor? I was actually probably not old enough to be responsible for anybody's children. So I was more of a mentor in the role and really just supporting the activities. It was a camp that I had already been through uh, two years prior. So you were overseeing a lot of kids. It seems I'm seeing a pattern here playing dad to your siblings, paying, playing dad as camp counselor. How does this all relate to what you do at Voice Latin? I'm still committed to the work of educating young people and have been doing that all my life. My mother was the Head Start director. My aunts were teachers. And so it's integral to me, I think, the opportunity to educate young men of color um, and to see myself in them and to be for them what I wanted someone to be for me. Caleb? Hey, William, tell us about your hometown of Hartsville, South Carolina. My hometown, Hartsville, South Carolina, super proud to be from there. Population is 7,000, so we're a very small, tight-knit community. What do you learn from a small, tight-knit community? You learn the value of connection and community to how to build authentic relationships. People from my hometown know who my family is. They know who my grandmother was, what church she attended. And so you learn to dig deeper beyond the surface-level interactions. All right. So now you're in a big city. You're based out of uh, West Philadelphia. So what do you teach your students about those small town relationships that they can relate to a bigger metropolitan area like Philadelphia? So we really focus on trying to build community and connection. And so teaching students to leverage the relationships around you and to support one another in everything. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey. William, what's the best part of your day? What really lights your fire about what you're doing? I try to make a point to go see kids every day. I think my job is more about managing systems and adults and operations and seeing kids reminds me why I'm in the position to manage all those pieces for them. What did your growing up have to do with uh, why you're working at this school and doing what you're doing? So I actually started third grade in New York City in Long Island, excuse me, in Long Island, New York, which was a much more affluent community. My mother lost her job and we moved to South Carolina and I had to live with my grandparents. And so I saw the disparity between uh, wealth and what that means for your educational outcomes. And so trying to grant access and opportunity for my students has been my driver. Wait, wait what, what happened? You saw, you saw what could be, and you wanted to create that for others. What, what, what huh? Absolutely. I had, my mother had a job at IBM. So I had the benefit of just growing up in a community that had wealth and opportunity. I played instruments. I traveled abroad. And so thinking about that, and then losing her job and moving to a different community, I didn't have as much access. And so I realized the gap between what some students are afforded to have access to and what others do not have. And so my work is creating that for my students in West Philly. Wait a minute. You saw the disparity between what some kids had and what others. And it was like music lessons and I guess mm -hmm. tennis lessons and stuff like that. And you decided what was your life's work? To make sure that we balance equity. And so to do what I can to make connections and leverage that authentic relationship with uh, partners and programming and funders to close that access gap um, for my students in West Philly. Huh. So you taken on this responsibility to uh, raise your own family. I, excuse me to, um, well, it's really what it feels like. The boys Latin the Philadelphia really is your own family, isn't it? Absolutely. And so in the same way that I was leading my brothers at a young age, my work is to figure out what each and every one of those students need um, and to do my part to, to close the gap and make sure they have access and opportunity. You think you've been able to make a difference? Absolutely. I think we are seeing the first step of just building a culture of community in which kids feel connected, adults feel supported, 
and that we have a common goal. And so I take all those principles from learning from football. The goal is ultimately to win. We are going to see challenges, and so we're going to overcome them together. Uh huh. How long have you been the um, CEO of Boys Latin of Philadelphia? Since July 1st of 2021. So this is my new family. Uh huh. And do you ever get a chance to hang out with any of the kids? I go to the sporting events. And so when I come to the games, it's an opportunity to not talk books, not talk learning, um, really just hang out with the guys. And so I do that from time to time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that as a kid, you were very involved with the church. How were you involved with the church? And what's that have to do with what you're doing now? I actually went to church with my grandmother a great deal. And so that was probably three days a week. I think that taught me just respect for a different type of community. I think recognizing the value of faith and um, staying committed when things are challenging. So my faith has been huge for me. So you were raised not just by your mom, but by your grandmom as well? Yep. And so I am a family of extensions. I live with my grandmother, my great grandfather, aunts, cousins. Um, and so we are much more than just kind of a core nuclear family. On one hand, that could be really difficult. On the other hand, it sounds like you really absorbed it. What was the upside of you living with all these different relatives as opposed to me that I grew up with mom and dad? I count it as a privilege to have access to uh, elders, have access to different perspectives, uh, to listen to my grandmother and kind of how she lived life and how she views the world um, and to see the eyes through my great grandfather. Wow. So you really appreciate, the, you really absorb, you really appreciate uh, the, uh, the different folks in your life. And you're, you're really reasonably, you're very adaptable. What's the website of this organization that is Boys Latin in Philadelphia? Boyslatin.org. Boyslatin.org. We've been speaking with Dr. William Hayes, CEO of Boys Latin in Philadelphia here on Executive Leaders Radio. Stick around. We'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. Back, you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. I'd like to introduce Jessica Scully, president of Scully Company. Jessica, what is Scully Company? What are you folks up to? Scully Company owns and operates apartment communities. We um, manage over 8,000 apartments. Wow. Where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? And where are you in the pecking order? I'm from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. I have a younger sister, seven and a half years younger than I am. All right. Eight to 14. What kind of stuff were you up to? What's the list look like? Uh, I was a active gymnast. I played lacrosse, basketball, field hockey, spent a lot of time with my family. Uh, Sundays were big extended family days in our household. And I spent summers at the beach. Mm -hmm. Jim? Yeah, Jessica, you mentioned spending a lot of time in gymnastics growing up. How, how long were you practicing each day? I would I would play my regular school sports and then another two to three hours at gymnastics every night, all day Saturday meets on Sunday. So quite a bit of my free time. You also mentioned your, your dad picking up trash at some of the apartments that the family owned. I'm, I'm seeing a work ethic that permeates through this family business. How does this worth ethic guide you as president at Scully Company? Well, it's probably some of the discipline that I learned, but it, having my dad just do the right thing because it's the right thing and having that be part of the value system and the work ethic to lead by, you know, doing the right thing, spreading examples. We teach in our company today that everybody's a leader. It doesn't matter what your position is. And it's because you take the time to do the right thing and have the mm -hmm. discipline to always do it. Chuck? You said you uh, spent time at the beach. Were you just hanging out on the beach or were you working? Well, I kept getting caught sneaking off the beach to go watch soap operas on television. So when I was 13, my dad said, that's it. It's time for a job. And I was and young. Where, where so did you end up working? Where did you we, end up working? Our, our family business had recently acquired a hotel, Ocean City, New Jersey, the Port Hotel. And so my dad dumped me on them and they found a spot for me behind the front desk answering telephones, an old antiquated phone system. And he paid me out of his pocket and I worked. What, what, so what was that like? I mean, everybody must have the same complaint when they come to the front desk, right? So customer service was a skill I learned and pleasing people was something I learned very young. And I also learned that I had my own opinions very young about how things should be run. And by the time I was 15, I was stuffing the suggestion box myself. 
you were stuffing the suggestion box yourself. So you had your own ideas about how to do things. What's that have to do with your role as the president of the Scully Company? Well, I've always been opinionated, clearly. I think, you know, understanding a business from the inside out and sort of having that bird's eye view of sitting and watching everyone from behind the front desk and how your business operates and understanding the customer experience and how you can make it better is something I've carried through to everything we do today. Mr. Stonecipher. Jessica, I'd like to hear a little bit about the relationship with your sister having a seven and a half year uh, age gap is quite a spread there. What would she tell me about you? <laughs> she would tell me that... Uh, Unfortunately for her, I'm like a third parent. I, I passionately try to help her not make mistakes that I've made. And so I've experienced a lot of things before her because of our age difference. And um, I have trouble not sharing all of those experiences, even if it's un unwanted sometimes. <laughs> that, uh, that inherent need to lead and parent, does that translate to what you're doing today at the, at the company? I think that's a really interesting connection that you're making there. Absolutely. I mean, we have such great people and we're like a tight kit, tight knit community. We're a family business and we have made sure that we want to hold on to that family value work ethic piece of our business. And everybody is like one big family. So it's not just about coming and doing the work. It's about how to support each other. And we understand that people need support in every part of their lives. And we actually take care of people in their homes and their lives. So it all just kind of rolls together and being sort of in the background, trying to support everybody in every way I can is something I've just always enjoyed doing. Mr. Jackowitz. Um, <clears throat> Jessica, tell me, what did you learn from mom and dad that you take to work with you every day? So my father's a perfectionist and, you know, I used to take rides in the car with him for him on the weekends when he couldn't sit still to go, uh, check out on our apartment communities. We have a portfolio in Florida because it rained one day on family vacation in Florida and he popped me in the car and we started looking at real estate. And so, you know, his eyes for the business and understanding the basics from ground up from starting with him in the car as a little kid is all the fundamentals that I draw on. And, you know, my mom is a PhD in psychology and she was that person when I came home from school and said somebody was mean to me, she would say, instead of my poor baby, well, have you thought about what's happening with them to make them feel this way? And so she gave me some incredible people skills and really putting myself in everybody's shoes and understanding sometimes what people say and do isn't really a reflection of the situation on hand at all. And I think that's helped from negotiation to customer service and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Caleb. Hey, Jessica, you mentioned being quite opinionated growing up. So were there any uh, activities that you were able to practice or refine that? So I joined the debate team when I was in high school. It started sort of as I had to pick an extracurricular non-sport. And I thought, well, arguing sounds like fun. Um, it also was because we had a very cool model UN trip to New York every year. And I had a very social side to me. And that really drew me into that. And my mother always used to say to me when I was little um, that, you know, I could have, I, I could be an attorney. So I think that's what drew me to debate. And today we use something called predictive indexing in our company. And uh, it sort of says what different people's innate core thing is. And, you know, mine happens to be a persuader. So I think it's, it's maybe just somewhere in my DNA. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey. Jessica, you're third generation Scully. Um, what was the impact of your grandfather passing on you and your decision to work for the family business? So I was very close to my whole family, you know, idolized my grandfather. I used to sit on his lap and he'd talk about building me a house. He started as a home builder. It was months before I realized he was talking about a dollhouse, but um, you know, I was very close to him and, and he one day in the office had a stroke and, you know, went to the hospital and ultimately passed away. And I, I definitely could hear the chatter around the family between my father and my uncle and the stress level he had interest rates had shot up to like 21%, 22%. And he really sort of in my interpretation as a child died for the company. So I felt like, Hey, this is a family business. This is what we do. I want to do this. And so by age eight, I had the plan to work in the family business someday. And, and how do you feel about what you're doing today? What are you most proud of? So I have um, 
always found it very daunting when you look at what the success rate is to go into third generation. So I think it's some quick stats, like 40% of businesses make it to second generation and then 13 make it through third generation. And so I have been driven by those statistics for a long time. And our industry, even though it's bricks and mortar, has changed tremendously. We went from landlords to customer service ambassadors and technology has changed our industry so much. So part of why family businesses and multi-generational family businesses don't succeed is because they don't always change with the times, but still hold on to those core values and guiding principles. So I've really made sort of what my life's passion is to hold on to the principles started with my grandfather, tremendously expanded on by my father and my uncle mm -hmm. and adapted it to, to today's world and culture and mm -hmm. customer experience and what just drives the, employees. Just to assuming, uh, assuming grandpa is uh, your grandfather's looking down. How do you think he feels considering what you've done to the business? I would certainly hope that he would feel proud. Why? Um, you know, I, I, there's a, there's a bit of a tribute and service that drives me and, you know, our family is very tight and we take care of each other and it's a fight, tight family culture. And I, I sort of feel that inside and, and that, you know, makes me want to do better. How, how large is this? How large or how small is the team, the employees, how many employees do you have? And how's this, uh, how's this uh, translate to them? So we have over 250 employees and it's really, really fascinating that you asked that question. One of our sort of driving things as a company, one of our three most important goals is something we call Scully Pride. And so it's about that pride that you have in your work and what you do and how you feel when you leave work and what your everyday career feels like. And it, mm -hmm it translates to the experience that our customers have, that our right. residents have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that pride just came out of me to answer your question about my grandfather, uh, isn't lost on me. How interesting that is. Uh, the website address for the Scully company, scullycompany.com. We've been speaking with Jessica Scully, president of Scully company here on executive leaders radio. Stick around. We'll be back in a moment, right after this quick break. This is Herb Cohen, your Executive Leaders Radio host, and the CEOs we've interviewed on this show are interested in helping you get your business started and helping you grow your business, whether you're aware of the issues or whether you want the CEOs to give you a hand identifying the issues in getting your business started and or in growing your business, why don't you email us at Consult at executiveleadersradio.com. That's consult at executiveleadersradio.com. Whether you're interested in having our CEOs speak with you regarding getting your business started or growing your business, send us an email at consult at executiveleadersradio.com. And we'll be sure to get back to you shortly with some help. back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Rory Retrieve, President and CEO of MidPen Bank. Rory, what is MidPen Bank? What are you guys doing? MidPen Bank is a $4.7 billion community bank headquartered in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah, one of the largest banks in Pennsylvania. Where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? I'm actually from uh, the city of Harrisburg. I'm the uh, fourth of six boys. All right. What were you doing eight to 14? What kind of stuff were you up to? What's the list look like? It was a, uh, every day was packed between sports and uh, trying to make some money school, of course. Uh, so that, that was pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. Caleb. Hey Rory. So I'm from Harrisburg as well. What part of the city are you from? Allison Hill section. Allison Hill. That, that has a little bit of a tough reputation. Definitely one of the harder parts of this city to grow up in. So I think in a place like that, it's usually pretty important to select a good friend group. What was your friend group like? 
Yeah, and, and we did. We had we, I had a great friend group, uh, you know, guys that I went to uh, grade school with and ultimately high school. And we were the ones that, you know, every day pulling together, whether to play baseball or football or basketball or street hockey, uh, whatever it took. And and, you know, you always wanted to surround yourself with uh, people that were like minded and and, uh, you know, had the same type of values uh, that you did. Were you able to help keep each other out of trouble? Yeah, I think pretty much. I mean, you know, none of my friends uh, and none of my brothers, we all stayed away from trouble with the law and uh, maybe did a couple bad things here and there, but, uh, you know, nothing, nothing too serious. So you told us in the green room, I believe Mid Penn Bank is 550 employees or so. So now it's a pretty big friend group. How do you go about selecting those employees and, and mentoring them and keeping them out of trouble? Yeah. So, you know, we, we kind of uh, focus on three things here as we're trying to hire employees, Caleb, and we, that's attitude, aptitude, and work ethic. And if you give me someone that has all three of those things in an abundance, you'll, they'll be a successful person in mid Penn bank. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck. In the green room, uh, Rory, you mentioned that you were involved with student council. What, what made you uh, get involved with that? You know, when I was, uh, uh, went up to high school for my eighth grade and the president of the school was addressing the uh, the assembly. I looked at the guy next to me, Jim Burns, and I said, you know what? Someday I'm going to be the president of the school and you're going to be my vice president. Four years later, I was the president of the school and he was the vice president. Wow. Did you did you run a campaign for that? Did you promise everyone uh, ice cream at lunch or something or what would you do? No, <laughs> no, we didn't promise ice cream at lunch, but we did follow the uh, the same campaign slogan that uh, Reagan and Bush had, which is the time is now. So that was our campaign slogan. The time is now. Uh, and then how does that translate to running a five, nearly five billion dollar bank? Well, you know, the, to to be to develop those persuasive skills, because, you know, running a student council in high school, you have to be able to convince the administration to be able to do what the all the students want. And today running a company like this, we have shareholders to balance out and we have employees and customers and, uh, you know, it's all those same skills of persuasion come into play. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stonecipher. Rory, you told me earlier you enjoyed playing football growing up as a kid and specifically played quarterback. So uh, besides having a strong arm and some scrambling skills, what uh, what other traits made you a successful quarterback? You know, Dave, it, it, it was mostly, you know, sandlot football, right? So the most important part of that was drawing up the plays in the dirt. And I love drawing up plays in the dirt. So I, I didn't always play quarterback, but I was always drawing up the plays in the dirt. Well, how does that uh, how does that creativity lead into what you're doing today? Look, you know, every day is drawing up plays in the dirt at this bank. I mean, things move so fast. We have grown tremendously uh, in my time here from 550 million to 4.7 billion. And each and every day requires some some play writing in the dirt. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackowitz. I understand, Rory, that uh, mom and dad got divorced when you were two. Um, what are the three most important things to you? You know, again, uh, growing up in the environment that I did in a, in a uh, divorced family with a bunch of boys uh, in, a, in a pretty big friend group for each person, I think the things that were most important to me over time and are most important to this company now are that, that attitude, aptitude and work ethic. And that means a positive attitude every day, no matter what's going on in your life. You know, you don't have to be the smartest person in the world, but you have to be able to learn concepts and you have to work hard. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are we, uh, what are we missing about you there? Well, we're, Jim, what, what was your question? Yeah. yeah, Roy, how young were you when you started making money? Eight years old. I had a, uh, uh, I sold grit newspapers uh, throughout the city and made a good bit of money doing so. And you mentioned mom didn't work because she was raising six boys. Was, was working at that early a, an age? Was that out of, partly out of necessity? Yeah, it really was. And each and every one of my brothers, they all worked from an early age. And, you know, we all threw our money in the middle of the table. And that's how my mom paid the bills. But uh, all my brothers uh, have now they didn't follow the same educational pursuits that I did, but all had in, uh, and still today have incredible work ethics. Mm -hmm. You and your brothers contributing like that. I mean, what do you what did you learn from that? What do you take with you from that to how you run mid Penn Bank? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think one of the most important uh, parts of running a community bank is what we give to the community. Um, and, you know, we at MidPen Bank, we focus on two big charities, breast cancer charities and uh, prostate cancer charities. And we do a lot of things throughout the year. And it's all of our employees. We run a great celebrity golf tournament. 
in July and we do a no shave November in November. And it's all of the employees pulling together, you know, kind of throwing their efforts in the middle of the table to, to uh, make some really big contributions to worthwhile charities. Jeffrey. So, uh, Rory, we were talking in the green room about mentoring and education, and uh, you mentioned you have three daughters. What have you learned from your daughters? Yeah, considering well, you you're know, running a four point seven billion dollar bank, what have you learned? Yeah, from these and you had all you had all brothers and a lot of pals, but you have yeah. three girls. You have three girls. What have you learned from your daughters? Yeah, so you know, growing up there was a lot of testosterone. Now it's a lot of estrogen, and and uh, you know, I have three great daughters. Um, one kind of followed, you know, my footsteps a little bit, went to the same university as me and is now in banking in the Philadelphia area. Uh, the second one is is currently at the University of Pittsburgh. And the youngest one is a, a little bit different. She's uh, pursuing musical arts and in uh, musical theater. And she's a junior in high school. And I learn from those three each and every day. They, along with my wife, are the most important people in my life. What, what have you, you learned mean? from them? Yeah, what yeah, have what you, you learned? Mean? Mm -hmm. So, so my, my oldest daughter now, you know, they, they have a lot more privileged life than I did, right? When we were little, you had to work because you had to have money because if you wanted to live, my daughters never really had to, to work because my wife and I have been uh, fortunate, but my, my youngest or my oldest daughter got a job at 14 years old and she hasn't stopped working since the middle ones following in her footsteps and the youngest one. She's 16 years old. She has two jobs right now, and <laughs> she works as hard as as anyone I know. So it sounds like so, you've managed to um, that, that, this, that this work ethics permeated the family. Yes, it absolutely, Herb. It it did with my brothers, uh, and it has with my with my daughters. They're they're incredibly hard workers, and which I think is even more impressive than than the way my brothers and I were because we weren't you know, we didn't have any privileges and my daughters, you know, you, they don't necessarily have to work. They just want to. They want to work. So you really, you know, you, the thing about expecting, it's not who you are. It's really, do you enjoy your work? I mean, you're running a $4.7 uh, billion dollar bank. Herb, I love my job. And, uh, you know, being able to, to be the leader of this company, um, and, and build this team, this is an, it's an incredible team and we do really good work. Um, you know, not just supporting the community with those in the charities, but in all the things that we do for our customers, helping people achieve their financial dreams, the work we did with PPP in uh, 2020 and 2021 was really important for a lot of small businesses and the employees of those small businesses. So I take it as, uh, the, you know, the source of pride in my life that I ended up in this industry. And, and uh, I just I really think it's a, a great place to be. It sounds me. like you feel uh, blessed in your role as opposed to commander in chief and telling people what to do. You feel like, you uh, yeah, that is, this isn't, there's no, there's no commander in chief here. It's, it's a complete team effort. I've got really great associates throughout the company and, uh, and I love them all. And, and we have a, a very tight knit company. I think that if you ask any one of the 550 employees, it all tell you, it's like a family and we work really hard to do that. I manage this company with my heart, uh, not necessarily my head. The head's there to, to guide a little bit, but, but we really treat each other, you know, with the golden rule. Treat them like you would like to be treated, and, and that's, I think it's worked really well for us. The website address for, the, for MidPen Bank? MidPenBank.com, M-I-D-P-E-N-N-Bank.com. We've been speaking with Rory Retrieve, President and CEO of MidPen Bank here on Executive Leaders Radio. Jeff, can you give us a rundown on who we've had on the air today, please? Sure, Herb. We had Matthew Knowles, CEO of Crumdale Partners. We had Dr. William Hayes, CEO of Boys Latin School of Philadelphia. Jessica Scully, President, Scully Company. And Rory Retrieve is the President and CEO of MidPen Bank. I'd like to thank my co-hosts, including Jim Wilson, Newmark, Caleb Hoppus, Hanlon, Dave Stonecipher, Herbine, David Jackowitz, Evolution Financial Group, Mr. Chuck Ormsby, Seminoff Ormsby, and Jeff Mack from Newmark for giving me a hand structuring the questions. Hope we're providing our listening audience an educational and entertaining show. Don't forget to visit our website. It's Executive Leaders Radio. Dot com to learn more about our executive leaders. That's executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders. Thank you for joining us today and have a nice day. Bye-bye.